Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast, a podcast covering topics around drug discovery and development, pharma and biotech. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through this episode. Today's episode is taken from our winter 2018-19 issue, and is titled Systems Pharmacology, When Multitargeting is Advantageous. And this episode is part one of two episodes. The article was written by Dr. Kirkwood A. Pritchard Jr., Dr. Dustin P. Martin, and Dr. Stephen Naylor. Before today's episode, we just wanted to ask a small favour, that if you are listening to and enjoying the Drug Discovery World podcast, please do leave us a review on iTunes. We'd massively appreciate it, and it would be great to get all your feedback. So now on to the main article. Systems Pharmacology. When multi-targeting is advantageous. The safety and efficacy of therapeutic drugs still requires improvement. In part, this is due to the promiscuity of individual drugs, which on average can interact with an estimated 6 to 28 off-target moieties. However, the advent of both systems biology and precision medicine has stimulated a rethink on the process of therapeutic drug design and polypharmacology. More recently, the definition of polypharmacology has morphed to represent therapeutic drugs that have been designed deliberately for multi-targeting that affords beneficial effects to the patient. This emerging effort has been labelled systems pharmacology, and the products are referred to as multi-target or systems pharmacology drugs. The current drug discovery and development paradigm was conceived in the early 1960s, and has remained relatively unchanged over the past roughly 60 years. The authors and others have argued that this continues to be a risk-laden, slow, costly and inefficient process, as well as delivering products of questionable value in terms of safety, toxicity and efficacy. For example, significant cumulative risk is associated with any efforts to bring a candidate drug to market. The initial screening of compound libraries 104 to 106 candidates, leads to a single lead compound that has only a roughly 8% chance of successfully traversing the clinical trials gauntlet. In addition, the failure rate of a drug candidate at each clinical trial phase is reported to be 46% in phase 1, 66% in phase 2, and 30% in phase 3. The average time required from drug discovery to product launch remains an eye-watering 12 to 15 years. In addition, the total capitalised cost of bringing a new drug to market was recently estimated at a staggering $2.87 billion. The metrics associated with the drug discovery and development process are clearly problematic. There is also a concern about the safety and efficacy value proposition of current marketed therapeutic drug products produced by the current drug discovery and development process. In part, this is due to 1. Drug safety Not all approved drugs stand the test of market pressures due to the scrutiny of pharmacovigilance and post-market surveillance. In some cases, approved drugs can be removed from the market because they manifest safety, effectiveness or economic problems. For example, from 1994 to 2015, the USA Food and Drug Administration, FDA, issued 215 withdrawal of application notices. During that same time period, the FDA actually recalled 26 drugs from the US market predicated primarily on safety concerns. And the second reason? Drug effectiveness. There is now a significant body of evidence that indicates individual patients diagnosed with the same disease indication respond differently to the same therapeutic drug. For example, Spears and co-workers analysed the effectiveness of a number of different drug classes against major disease indications. They found that most drugs were roughly 30-75% to effective, as determined by patient responses. The lowest responders were oncology patients treated with conventional cancer chemotherapy agents, where 25% of patients responded positively. In contrast, the highest percentage of patient responders resulted from treatment with COX-2 inhibitors at 80%. Therapeutic drugs were reported to be ineffective for Alzheimer's, 70%, arthritis, 50%, diabetes, 43%, and asthma at 40% of patients. The authors have argued in the past that the blockbuster model has inadvertently led to the wagon of woe for the drug discovery and development process. 
This approach utilized the one drug, one target model that was relatively effective in large, poorly defined, heterogeneous patient populations. The authors have suggested the integrated use of more efficient technologies, decision-making tools, systems biology, and personalized and precision medicine in order to overcome the limitations of such a model. They have presented the concept of systems biology, personalized and precision medicine approaches for the production of more effective and safe therapeutic drugs, particularly in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. In addition, the authors have suggested that the development of precision medicine drugs, as well as an integrated technology platform drug discovery and development approach, may also facilitate improved drug pipeline products. In this episode, we discuss drug polypharmacology, which has usually been equated with therapeutic drug target promiscuity, resulting in safety toxicological side effects and reduced efficacy. More recently, the term has been used to describe the benefits of a single drug affecting change at multiple targets, one drug multi-targets, for more efficacious impact of the drug predicated on systems biology and precision medicine considerations. All this is considered and discussed, as well as the emerging paradigm of systems pharmacology. Human complexity, systems biology, and precision medicine. The original one drug, one target model was predicated on a rather simplistic perspective of human anatomy and physiology. The health of an individual was determined by a number of diagnostic markers, such as blood glucose levels. When the concentration levels of such a marker changed beyond a certain defined clinical range, then the patient was diagnosed with a specific disease indication. Administration of a single drug that modulated a specific target changed the concentration of the diagnostic marker back to a normal range value, reverting the individual's pathobiological state to healthy status. However, with the advent of systems biology and a new paradigm driven by precision medicine, a greater understanding of human complexity emerged, concomitant with the re-evaluation of the one drug, one target paradigm. Human complexity and variability. In the past, our understanding and appreciation of human complexity and variability at the cellular, individual and population level has constantly been constrained by lack of adequate analytical, bioinformatic and knowledge management technologies. In addition, our comprehension of the dynamic nature of human metabolism and physiology as a function of time was also extremely limited. Furthermore, diagnosis, prognosis and treatment decisions had been driven by a reductionist approach, which led to the development of relatively simple physiological models, as well as a rudimentary and incomplete understanding of complex biological processes occurring in individuals. This has all resulted in a limited ability to make unambiguous and decisive decisions about optimal therapeutic drug treatments for individual patients. It is salutary to consider the dynamic complexity and variability of an individual human patient. For example, at the cellular level, a single human cell is made up of roughly 100 trillion water molecules, roughly 20 billion proteins, and around 850 billion fat molecules, roughly 5 trillion sugars and amino acids, roughly 1.5 trillion inorganic moieties, roughly 50 million RNA molecules, and 2 meters of DNA within 23 pairs of chromosomes. We estimate, based on the energy requirements of individual cells in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, turnover, there are roughly 860 billion chemical reactions and interactions performed per day in a single cell. At the individual level, a single human being consists of roughly 37.2 trillion cells, made up of 210 different cell types and 78 organs or organ systems. In addition, each one of us hosts roughly 100 to 300 trillion microbes, composed of roughly 10,000 different species, that constitutes 1 to 3% of our body weight, and contain an estimated 8 million protein coding genes. These microorganisms play an intimate and interwoven role in the health and pathobiology of the human host. The molecular machinery of the human body comprises roughly 19,000 coding genes, around 20,000 gene-coded proteins, and 250,000 to 1 million splice variants, and post-translationally modified proteins more than 100 million antibodies, 
and around 40,000 metabolites. The combined length of DNA in an individual is calculated at approximately 2 by 10 to the power of 13 meters, which is the equivalent of 70 round trips between the Earth and the Sun. We estimate also that the total number of chemical reactions and interactions occurring in a single individual is around 3.2 by 10 to the power of 25 per day. This exceedingly large number is actually greater than the number of grains of sand estimated to be present on the entire planet, which has been calculated at 7.5 by 10 to the power of 18. A further layer of complexity is that an individual human is obviously not a closed system. On a daily basis, each one of us requires inputs as well as outputs. For example, we consume on average roughly 1.2 kilograms a day of food and drink, if you're following current healthy living advice, and roughly 6 to 8 liters a day of fluid. It is also thought provoking to consider that more than 25,000 bioactive food and beverage components have been identified. At any one time in the consumption of a normal meal, an individual may consume several thousand individual bioactive chemicals. In addition, we plaster onto our bodies around 100 to 500 cosmetic ingredients on a daily basis. In terms of output, we lose 6 litres of fluid per day via urination, which contains around 3,000 active chemical constituents. We also remove, on average, 350 to 500 grams of solid waste products through defecation on a daily basis, and up to 6 litres of sweat depending on physical exertion. All of this activity is mediated by a transport system consisting of around 100,000 kilometres of arteries, veins and capillaries, moving approximately 5 litres of blood and lymph fluid throughout the body. It is interesting to put all this into context and consider that a modern miracle of technology, the beloved Boeing 747 aircraft, has only 6 million parts and a mere 285 kilometers of wiring or tubing. Is it reasonable to wonder aloud why we struggle with accurate prognosis, diagnosis, and treatment, or indeed, as to why we actually function at all? The authors have previously discussed that it is possible to quantify human complexity, but in the case of human variability, we are confounded by the range and subtlety of these differences. Such traits can be transitory or permanent, and influenced in complex ways by both genetic and or environmental factors. Sources of human variability include gene mutation, germline and somatic, allelic differences, genetic drift, social and cultural influences, and nutrition. Common human variations include obvious visible differences, such as gender, age, and physical appearance. These differences are determined through poorly understood molecular processes. Such processes are modulated by a wide variety of molecular entities and processes that include, but are not restricted to, single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, alternative gene splicing and protein isoforms, and epigenetic phenomena. Our basic understanding of these processes have led to the creation of simple semantic descriptors which define such differences and include concepts such as gender, age differentiation, and race. However, such coarse descriptions do not provide adequate insight into the significant and subtle differences that separate us at the molecular level, given that all humans are 99.9% .9 genetically the same at the DNA level. Finally, the temporal effect on complexity and variability is an even poorer understood process. Paradoxically, age is the most obvious manifestation of physical change in the individual. We can all recognize the phenotypical differences between infants versus a young girl or boy versus an elderly woman or man. Also, it is well known that we lose bone density, shrink, and our metabolism slows down. However, our understanding of individual or population changes at the molecular and cellular levels is still in its infancy. In the past, our understanding of this staggering dynamic complexity and variability has been myopic and limited. Hence, how can we produce safe and efficacious therapeutic drugs for individual patients? Systems Biology The emergence of systems biology also known as pathway, network, or integrative biology, was predicated on an attempt to address and embrace human complexity and variability 
in human metabolism, physiology, and pathobiology. The development of systems biology is still in its nascent ascendancy. In its first generational incarnation in the 1940s and 50s, a systems approach to biology was predicated on theoretical considerations of complex systems analysis. Second generation systems biology in the late 1990s and early 2000s has its roots in high throughput analytical omic measurements, bioinformatics, bioengineering, computational sciences, and mathematics. It is an attempt to establish a more integrated and hierarchical paradigm that facilitates the creation of new biological pathways and networks at the molecular and cellular level. This provides a framework for understanding the holistic system of genetic, genomic, transcriptomic, protein, metabolite, and cellular events that are in constant flux and interdependent. In order to facilitate such efforts, two distinct approaches have evolved, namely computational modeling-based systems biology and data-driven systems biology. The former relies primarily on computational modeling and simulation tools. While there has been some confusion in the past about terminology, it is also now referred to as bottom-up systems biology. The latter approach predominantly uses analytical datasets that are mined in a discovery manner for new knowledge using a variety of bioinformatics and knowledge assembly tools, and is now categorized as top-down systems biology. Implementation of systems biology in drug discovery and development. Back in 2004, the authors gave the opinion that systems biology could provide a new dynamic to invigorate pharmaceutical companies, predicated on a more complete understanding of problems associated with the drug discovery and development process. A consensus emerged that systems biology had the potential to impact the entire drug discovery and development process by identifying biological subsystems and how they interact to produce complex molecular, pathway network, cellular, tissue, and organism behavior. Such claims appear extraordinary when you consider the complexity and variability of both individuals as well as different human subpopulations. In addition, the difference in molecular, pathway network, cellular tissue and organism reaction timeframes and proximal distances is dramatic, and attempts to integrate all such processes appears exceedingly difficult. However, in spite of these daunting obstacles, there has been a great deal of activity in the application of systems biology to the drug discovery and development process, and a number of books have been written on the subject. But to date, the effect of systems biology on drug discovery and development has been somewhat underwhelming because of interpretation and utilization difficulties with the data and information obtained on specific biological subsystem or system perturbations. Due to the aforementioned limitations, systems biology has only provided notable insights into 1. drug target networks, 2. predictions of drug target interactions, 3. adverse drug effects of drugs, 4. drug repositioning, and 5. predictions of drug combination. There are continued efforts to broaden the applicability of systems biology to the drug discovery and development process. For example, recently, the authors and others have suggested a systems biology approach to provide an understanding of causal onset, progression, and effective treatment of any disease, including complex disease states such as type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. The authors have proposed the following broad-based systems biology approach to drug discovery. 1. Network Biology Discovery Multi-omic analysis at the gene, protein, and metabolite level 2. Identification of potential targets The network biology analysis should provide a prioritized list of target genes and or proteins 3. Functional Validation Utilization of RNAi screens to either overexpress or knock down each of the selected genes in the system under investigation 4. Drug candidate screen. Selected, prioritized molecular targets that are expressed in the tissue or organ under investigation. And five, target selection evaluation. Any target must be expressed in the pathobiological tissue or organ, and causal onset, progression, and dynamic, temporal elements must be demonstrated. Clearly, 
there is much to do before systems biology can adequately demonstrate its routine and practical usefulness in drug discovery and development. But the trends discussed here, albeit briefly, provide encouragement for the near future. In comparison, systems biology has had a much greater impact on the evolution of precision medicine over the last decade. Precision medicine. We described recently, in some detail, the advent of precision medicine drugs. The development of such therapeutic agents is a continuing and realistic attempt to improve the efficacy of therapeutic drugs by treating targeted patient subpopulations. The term precision medicine was first coined by Clayton Christensen in his book, The Innovator's Prescription, published in 2009. However, the descriptor precision medicine did not gain wide acceptance and usage until a report entitled Toward Precision Medicine, Building a Knowledge Network for Biomedical Research and a New Taxonomy of Disease, was published by the US National Research Council, NRC, in 2011. The report stated, Precision medicine is the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual characteristics of each patient. It does not literally mean the creation of drugs or medical devices that are unique to a patient, but rather the ability to classify individuals into subpopulations that differ in their susceptibility to a particular disease, in the biology and or prognosis of those diseases they may develop, or in their response to a specific treatment. Preventative or therapeutic interventions can then be concentrated on those who will benefit, sparing expense and side effects for those who will not. This approach utilizes individuals and defined subpopulation-based cohorts that have a common network of disease taxonomy. In addition, it requires an integrated molecular and clinical profile of both the individual as well as the subpopulation-based cohort. We have discussed that precision medicine uses a 1 in N model in contrast to the N of 1 personalized medicine model. This is predicated on widely used biostatistical data analysis and big data analytical tools, and forms the basis of precision medicine drug development. Precision medicine drugs. Precision medicine drugs are defined as those therapeutic products for which the label includes reference to specific biological markers, identified by diagnostic tools that help guide decisions and or procedures for their use in individual patients. It is important to note that the physician utilizes the biological biomarker or biomarkers listed on the drug label in prescribing the precision medicine drug. Last year, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, CDER, at the FDA, approved a record high 59 new drugs. However, 24, 40%, of them were classified as molecularly targeted, representing a new annual record for precision medicine drugs approved. This continues the trend from 2017, where of the 46 new drugs approved, 16 of them, around 35%, were classified as precision medicine drugs. The use of precision medicine drugs is another example being employed by the pharmaceutical sector to improve the quality of therapeutic drugs provided to individual patients. These advances are predicated on the advent of precision medicine and its focus on the grouping and identification of subpopulations, one in N model. In turn, precision medicine was conceptualized from our more refined and detailed understanding of human pathobiology and pathophysiology, brought about by the development of systems biology tools, technologies, and insights. This episode was part one, titled Systems Pharmacology, When Multitargeting is Advantageous, and was written by Dr. Kirkwood A. Pritchard Jr., Dr. Dustin P. Martin, and Dr. Stephen Naylor. We'll be going through the author's bios at the end of part two. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can subscribe to Drug Discovery World free of charge by visiting our website at dw-online.com where you can also view all of our articles, including references and images, and download original PDFs of the articles. You can find the links in the show notes. If you've enjoyed the podcast, then we'd really appreciate a minute of your time to leave us a review, and you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. As always, thank you for listening, and we'll hope to see you in part two, our next episode. <laughs>